are kind of up in the air. Things are right now being passed through a continuing resolution, which is kind of like keeping the government funded for a certain period of time. And I think that's currently going on right now because I think people are trying to wait until President-elect Trump comes into office and make his decision. But when I think about policy, I feel like policy that is being implemented can have, it can have a positive impact, but it can also have a negative impact. When you think about it, particularly if you are a woman and you are, or you're in a marginalized and disenfranchised community, various policies that are being implemented technically do tend to affect women majority of the time when you think about it. Someone's trying to tell you, okay, when can I do family planning? When can I get contraception? I'm trying to be safe. I'm trying to prevent myself from HIV, contracting HIV AIDS. Or even if you're a woman and you're in a domestic violence or physical violence situation, not all policies tend to be in favor to protect you. So I feel like when thinking about public policy and policies that are being implemented both in the US and globally, you definitely have to be considerate of the population that you're trying to impact. But at the same time, as Cameron said, funding does kind of go hand in hand. But I definitely think if you implement the right policies, you can see substantial change. We're currently in a time right now with a new president coming in. And you think about the global health landscape. We have made plenty of strides with decreasing HIV AIDS rates. Um, maternal, maternal child health mortality outcomes have been reduced. So I would say thinking about where we go forward with public policy, as we all know, majority of Republicans tend to implement conservative, more policies which are more pro-life and so forth. But at the same time, I think where we are right now and how many strides we have made with the US involvement in various global health projects and international development projects, I definitely think we should think about moving forward and not making substantial and crazy changes in policy, which can then have a negative outcome. Thank you, very astute. In light of this, uh, this train of discussion that we've been following, I wanted to ask you all, what does it mean to be a good leader? What kind of leaders do we need, especially in this global health uh, space? Um, and essentially, what qualities do you think make for a successful leader? Anyone? I can start. Um, so I think for a leader, an effective leader, a good leader, um, is going to be the ability, the gift, the skill to listen. Um, I'm 31 years old, and for most of my life, I thought I knew everything or I knew most of the answers. Uh, I mansplained, um, I talked down to people, um, and then just like recently, just trying to like humble myself and listen, take a step back. I might know the answer, but I may not know your perspective. And I want to know that perspective. So when I'm formulating my, my answer or thinking of different solutions, I'm also factoring in your perspective because we're gonna to have to share this world, right? So I need to know your perspective and I wanna know your perspective and I wanna know this person's perspective so I can have a better understanding instead of always running around saying, I wanna be understood. So I think a good leader would be able to listen to others. Thank you. I would say in addition to being a good listener, I would say a good leader definitely has to know how to inspire, empower, and uplift the people that you work with. Um, how are you inspiring those that you work with? Are you empowering them to be the best of their ability? Um, how are you trying to invoke change through them by lifting them up and not bringing them down? If someone lacks something, how are you trying to help them be better at what it is that they do? Thank you. Okay, everyone, want to weigh in? Uh, sure. Uh, I used to. <laughs> <laughs> I used to teach uh, health education at public schools around DC. And one of the things that that I did coming in when I first started freshman year, I was like 18. Some of the kids that I was teaching were 14, 15 years old. So there was like a little bit of an age difference. But I came in, and because the rest of the cohort of teachers, they were all, uh, to be honest, they were all predominantly white women from American and GW, I thought that I would be able to relate with these kids so much easier. So they would come in and they would do their little thing, and then I could walk in with all this swag and the kids would like cheer for me. I had this weird vision in my head of the impact that I was gonna make. It was, a, it was honestly a savior complex that I had coming in. Like every single like lifetime movie with black people. It was, it was weird. But 
so obviously that didn't pan out because my voice is funny and the way I walk and talk and act is funny and I obviously I'm not from DC. So as soon as I came to the classroom, there was this immediate distrust. And even though I was completely comfortable communicating with them at my level, I wasn't able to communicate with them on their level yet. I had no idea what was motivating them on a day-to-day -day basis. I remember one specific instance I came in because I would teach the same class over a period of days. And so I came in and they looked, at, they looked a little bit more dejected than normal. So they weren't engaging with me the way that the way that I expected them to. So I was like, "What's the deal, y'all? Like, why aren't y'all getting involved in this lesson about about lungs and condom use?" It was a weird thing, but it turned out that one of their classmates was actually shot the previous afternoon, and so I came in with this mentality that was entirely self-centered, self-centered. I thought that it was something that I was doing. I thought that it might have been their fault, but they just didn't want to talk to me. When their mind had, they, like, talking about condom use and talking about hepatitis and talking about lung cancer was the furthest thing from what they wanted to be bothered with. So I think it's important, I, I definitely want to echo that listening and communication are two of the most important things that you can do, not just as a leader, but as, as a human being. If you want to understand somebody, the first thing that you have to do is, is shut up and let them talk and hear them out for what they're trying to say. Thank you. So one of the things that all of the panelists have in common is their dedication to HIV AIDS uh, support education, awareness, and treatment. And I wanted to, considering that HIV AIDS impacts uh, the African American community in the United States at a very disparate rate than most any other community, I wanted to ask you all, what is the significance and the importance of working in communities that are predominantly marginalized here in the United States, especially but around the world. And I think Stephen, he touched on this just a little bit, but I would love to kind of dig deeper in that and hear from some of you or all of you on that question, that perspective. Um, I would say in the, in the communities I've worked with, um, folks who are injection drug users, uh, transgender women, gay and bisexual black men, um, these three, uh, these three groups are highly marginalized within the black community. Um, and so oftentimes having to check ourselves or check, I have to check myself and check my prejudices, um, I had to check my, my bias, I had to check my own stigma that I have that I project on other people. Um, a lot of people are dealing with a lot of things. They have different identities. Um, and not, not to say they have different identities. I have an identity. We all have different, you know, we, we, share, we share commonality, but we all have differences. And being able to come to the table and not have that savior complex, but try to understand people where they're coming from. So often what I would do is I would consider many of the clients and many of the people I was working with almost like, we're cousins, we just haven't been introduced as such. And so I have cousins who might be trans. I, I might have some cousins who are injecting heroin. I might have some cousins who are gay or bisexual and try to approach people with the compassion that I would want someone to approach me with. Um, so oftentimes it takes that, that extra step to say, I really don't know much about this topic. I've heard a lot of stuff in the barbershop about this topic, but maybe I need to go and ask some questions and listen and try to understand other people's perspectives. And then when you start to read a little bit more, you see that what's going on in DC is also happening in, in, uh, in Detroit, and it's also happening in Chicago, and it's also happening in, in Kampala, and it's also happening in Johannesburg. And you're able to connect those different communities and have a global perspective on those things and then also be able to pull resources and be able to strategize and employ tools that you can move forward 
Um, so I think that's one of the one of the takeaways that I've had uh, working with some you know marginalized communities. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. <laughs> okay. So another thing that I wanted to discuss is just the, the sectors in which we do this work. We've done this work on the government side and nonprofits, and there, there just seems to be so many nonprofit organizations that are committed to doing global health work. And I believe all of you have done work with nonprofit organizations. So I wanted to talk about what is the significance of working with these grassroots organizations and what place do they have in the global health space? I believe that the vast majority of, of grassroots global health organizations are, are incredibly important and in doing a lot, a lot of great work. There's obviously exceptions to, to every rule, but on the whole, these organizations are, are vital, a vital part of the health infrastructure of the countries and the communities that they serve. One of my, my biggest gripes with some of these organizations is the the Eurocentric t traditions and uh, sort of the Western traditions that they, they emerge from and almost exist to perpetuate. 